Alfred, who was required to finance his son's trip, was reluctant to agree. He saw this as yet more evidence of a need for diversion. It was Josiah Wedgwood, Darwin's uncle and future father-in-law, who persuaded Robert to change his mind. In 1831, Darwin set sail on the five-year expedition, which not only was to change his life, but would have a dramatic impact on the future of science. Darwin's five-year voyage endowed him with a new self-confidence and brought him scientific acclaim. He was happy and able to indulge in his favorite pastimes without interruption. He spent long periods ashore gathering data and specimens, many of which he sent back to England to various scientists and to London Zoo. These times ashore were a release from the almost continuous seasickness which afflicted him. On his expeditions, Darwin's shooting skills enabled him to collect a wide variety of bird species. These, together with his other specimens and detailed scientific observations, were part of the gradual process of discovery which laid the foundations of his theory. However, among those destined to become deeply significant were the studies he made on the Galapagos Islands. Darwin observed that the species of finches and tortoises varied distinctly from island to island. The true significance of these findings was to become clear after his return to England in 1836. Following his return from the voyage aboard HMS Beagle, Darwin had begun to catalogue and publish his scientific findings. However, the observations he made while on the voyage had aroused his doubts about the biblical version of creation. He could no longer accept that species were inalterably fixed. While making public the details of his journey, Darwin kept private a series of notebooks devoted to more controversial issues. This work was destined to produce his theory of natural selection. Although he was to spend 20 years in further research, by 1842 Darwin had completed an outline study which identified the basic elements of his theory. However, he made no attempt to publish his findings. During the first part of Darwin's scientific life back in England after the voyage. Um, he was not widely known, but he had a number of very close friends among the great scientists of the time. I think the obvious ones to mention are Sir Charles Lyell, the geologist, and Sir Joseph Hooker, who was um, the director of Kew Gardens. They would often come here to talk through his ideas with him, their own ideas, argue and discuss. On his return, Darwin published several volumes of geological observations, as well as his journal of researches, a detailed account of the voyage. Darwin valued his prestigious position and was reluctant to endanger it. He was convinced that publication of the origin of species would be greeted with public denunciation, even though evolutionary theories were not new. Darwin began writing the paper that would eventually become the origin of species fairly soon after he got back from the Beagle voyage, so in about 1837-38. But he delayed publishing for nearly 20 years because he was so terrified of what the public reaction might be. Um, he'd seen as a young man uh, admired fellow scientists being vilified and losing their positions in universities and museums because they had even voiced you know, the, the merest mention of evolutionary theories. So I think he was very justifiably frightened of, of what the public reaction would be and the effect it might have on his family. The history of evolutionary thought stretches back to the ancient world. Over the centuries, a variety of theories were advanced to explain life on Earth. However, by the 19th century, 
an increasing accumulation of scientific knowledge made it impossible to evade the challenge to religious belief. The early work of the geologist Charles Lyell revealed that the Earth had been subject to a process of slow, regular change. The idea of divine creation was challenged by research on fossils which showed some species to be extinct. Extinction was not easily explicable in terms of orthodox Christianity. The religious establishment identified the biblical story of Noah's Ark as evidence that a series of cataclysmic events accounted for the scientific findings. In effect, they argued that God, having punished the world for its sins, then repopulated it. Given this debate, when Darwin's controversial book was finally published, it did not emerge into a society unprepared for evolutionary views. What society was much less prepared for was Darwin's theory of natural selection. Certainly the fact that in Darwin's theory of, of evolution, millions of creatures seemed to serve no particular purpose except to advance evolution would be a worry. But I don't think one need say that the millions of creatures which existed on the paths of evolution existed merely in order to further evolution and had no joy, no pleasure in their own lives. I think they no doubt had a lower form of life but were still happy to exist. So I don't think they're a main problem of evil. There are other problems of evil and suffering but I don't see that it contributes largely to the matter of evolution. In the years immediately following his return to England, Darwin had not devoted all his energies to work. In 1839, Darwin married his cousin and friend, Emma Wedgwood. Both Emma and Charles came from wealthy families. Emma's Wedgwood dowry increased the considerable income which Darwin already enjoyed through his Darwin inheritance. His wealth freed Darwin from all the financial concerns which might have restricted his research. His choice of Emma as his wife was not based on romantic considerations. It rested more on her suitability. However, the couple were to demonstrate a deep affection for each other throughout their lives together. Darwin described Emma as his greatest blessing. Darwin was by nature sensitive, family-loving and reclusive. In September 1842, the Darwins, together with their two children, William and Anne, took up residence at Down House. For the next 40 years, Down House was to be Darwin's much-loved home and refuge, as well as his place of work. The house and grounds were to become a major influence on his continuing research. Situated in 18 acres of land in the Kent countryside, the position of the house was ideal. The family could enjoy a country life while being only 16 miles from London. Initially, the appearance of the house had aroused some reservations. However, the Darwins recognized its potential. Over the next few years, Down House was transformed into the comfortable and extensive home of an ever-growing family. Charles and Emma were devastated when their third child, Mary Eleanor, born only days after their arrival at Down, died within a few weeks. Darwin was worried about having married his first cousin, Emma, um, because he feared that it was possibly one reason why many of his children had such poor health. Um, two died in infancy, um, his daughter Mary and his last son Charles. One died at the age of ten and others were invalids for much of their childhood. He thought that inbreeding might have been a cause and worried about it really till the end of his life.